So today we're having a conversation with Tom Sturgis, American playwright, writer, and director, Preston Sturgis's son, about a Masters member. Well, thank you so much, first of all, for having me. I so appreciate it. My, uh, my own memory of the Masters was, it was an incredible club. Not a clubby club, because they let as many people in. You know, as you could act, you could be part of that club. Uh, and I went there as a child. I was uh, a guest of one of, uh, I guess, a member in very good standing, a gentleman named Percy Helton. Really? Who was a dear friend of my mom's. And I think he was trying to set her up on a date. I don't know. She was a little wary. But we ended up going and uh, seeing the inside of this amazing club. Enjoyed it. And my dad had a lot of connections to this club. A lot of the actors that he worked with, a lot of the people in his world were also members of the Maskers. Like a songwriter who's going to become a singer. So he started off writing the words and the scenes and the films for others to direct. And his dream was always to be the director. And he was always nudging people, you know, and he would sit, at the, sit on the set and uh, he was actually a dialogue coach and so began the seeds of his directing because he was able to coach people in how they spoke and, and he would advise the director. The, you know, I wrote it to do this and I said, yeah, tell him, go ahead and do that. So uh, he was at uh, Paramount, just down the street here, and, and uh, making probably four grand a week in 1938. So you can imagine this is when a gallon of milk is, what, a dime? And, um, and, he, and he had a script and he brought it to the powers that be. And he said, I wrote this at home on my own time. And I will sell it to you for a dollar if you let me direct it. And uh, it was a, the movie was called The Biography of a Bum. And it was the story of a man who starts the film on a bread line and ends up as the governor of Illinois through graft, corruption, vote buying, every cheat and scandal that was available, this guy and the machine around him used it until he, until he became governor. And the day he became governor, he became an honest man. And that's how the movie explodes at the end. So Paramount uh, said that a dollar doesn't seem fair, considering what we're paying you, we'll give you $10. True story, $10. And he was like, um, okay. But they let him direct it. They let him direct it. So that's the first ever time a writer directed his own screenplay. Well, my dad had this uh, organization, this a loosely based organization called the Great Sturgis Acting Company. And he would use the same, uh, the same actors, it, very much like a, a, a theater group would. Like, oh, you're the old irascible guy. Okay, I've got a part for you. Mm -hmm. And he explained this, and I'll, I'll read from a play that, uh, about him in a minute. Um, and he explained this by saying that if you were, a, if you were a, a, an actor in a play and you had no lines, you only got paid for a week if you would just show up. However, if you had a line, you got paid for the entire run of the film, which is the difference between a week's pay and an eight weeks pay. So he gave every one of his people one line. So there's a guy named Frank Moran, for instance, who's this uh, champion boxer, got hit too many times. He has one line, he's usually the driver. Where are you going, bub? <laughs> Boom, eight weeks of pay. And, uh, and, wow. and every other, of these character players, a guy I'm going to tell you a story about named Jimmy Conlon was, uh, you know, he's, he smoked little cigarettes and he was a nervous little guy and he was, hey, leave him alone, what do you do, hey, hey. He had a part in every movie. One movie he's a waiter, the next movie he's a piano salesman, the next time he's just a guy with a gun, you know, like a, a bad guy. So I think that's how my dad became involved and enamored of the maskers was through that process on all these guys that he was working with. Well, I love the way your dad incorporated really funny little things into his movie. Like when he went from, uh, when he left Paramount and he didn't edit uh, Hail the Conquering Hero right. and the guy screwed it up 
uh, whoever did it. Right. And, and he went back and edited on his own time. But they then he shot right. that train scene. Yes. And then he put the poster of his new movie. Right, in the scene. As <laughs> it's pulling scene. out, you yes. go. <laughs> right. It's like somebody wearing their own uh, T-shirt or logo or something like that. You know, he was, that was, I think, a thumb of the nose to his old bosses more than anything else. But the one thing my dad, as funny as he was, and a very funny man, never once is there a joke in any of the pictures. There's no point in where you go wah wah or badum ch, nothing. It's all, I think the beauty of my dad's writing and why it lasts and why people still care about it is because it's the truth. People are speaking the absolute truth and whether it's a woman trying to convince her husband that they should get a divorce and it's about time that they did. And it's, you know, it's very, it's, you wouldn't think that's a funny subject, but if, if you're telling your truth, you know, the truth is funnier than anything else anyway. What are a few of the things that you think future generations should take into account or know? Well, first writer director, I think is a big, big deal. Uh, and so for everybody who wants to write and direct, you know, that's, you know, that's, everybody follows him, that's Woody Allen follows him, that's Frank Capra follows him, that's uh, uh, Spike Lee follows him. Everybody follows because of this incredible thing that he broke that wall down. Um, I think his writing was so uh, forceful. I think as a man who was incredibly loyal to his friends, as evidenced by the fact that these guys got eight weeks of work for one line. Uh, I think that was fantastic. Um, very, very inventive, very creative. And uh, he also had a very interesting thing that he did when he was on the set. And that was that if you came up with a funnier line than a line that he had written down, he gave you a dollar. So as part of his legacy, the fact that he was not so precious mm -hmm. about it that there wasn't another laugh out there that somebody could do or there wasn't a better way to twist the joke or a look on the face that would make it mm -hmm. that a much more story. a better story help me tell my story yeah. yeah and one of the things that's so interesting and i i feel pride about this is that they're still talking about him he is still a conversation topic if you google preston sturgis you'll get 20 articles or 20 uh, references in the last year mm -hmm. uh, and not because well, so much to learn from his work there's you're still learning from it mm -hmm. I mean these some of these films of Sullivan's Travels is 70 years old right but you see it and it's current and active and real and touches you and if you're not weeping at the end you're a jerk mm -hmm. you know it's it's because he was able again my belief to be so truthful and uh, with the way people spoke and and reacted that there wasn't a, and the fact that there's no jokes. This is the key. Mm -hmm. Truth and not one, not one joke. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.